So from paragraph 2 to 52, his discussion is focused on how we perceive distance. So starting at paragraph 2, it is, I think, agreed by all that distance of itself and immediately cannot be seen. For distance being a line directed endwise to the eye, it projects only one point in the fund of the eye, which point remains invariably the same, whether the distance be longer or shorter. And then paragraph 3, I find it also acknowledged that the estimate we make of the distance of objects considerably remote is rather an act of judgment grounded on experience than of sense. For example, when I perceive a great number of intermediate objects such as houses, fields, rivers, and the like, which I have experienced to take up a considerable space, I hence form a judgment or conclusion that the object I see beyond them is at a greater distance. Again, when an object appears faint and small, which at a near distance I have experienced to make a vigorous and large appearance, I instantly conclude it to be far off. And this, it is evident, is the result of experience, without which from the faintness and littleness I should not have inferred anything concerning the distance of objects. In paragraphs 4 through 7, he then discusses how the science of the day explains our perception of distance through a mathematical analysis relying on lines and angles and parallelism, etc. So in response to this mathematical analysis of the day, he argues, starting in paragraph 8 through 11, where he lays out the logical foundation of his main argument, is that, starting with paragraph 9, first it is evident that when the mind perceives any idea, not immediately and of itself, it must be by the means of some other idea. Thus, for instance, the passions which are in the mind of another are of themselves to me invisible. I may nevertheless perceive them by sight, though not immediately, yet by means of the colors they produce in the countenance, which we often see shame or fear in the looks of a man by perceiving the changes of his countenance to red or pale. And then in 10, moreover, it is evident that no idea which is not itself perceived can be the means of perceiving any other idea. So if I do not perceive the redness or paleness of the man's face, it is impossible I should perceive by them the passions which are in his mind. So from paragraph 2 then, we know that distance is not perceived directly by sight, and yet we all use our vision to judge distance. Therefore, distance is brought into view by means of some other idea which is itself directly perceived. So then what is it that we directly and immediately perceive by sight which suggests the idea of distance to the mind? So in paragraph 12 to 15, Barclay says that it can't be what the existing science of the day says it is, because the lines and angles whereby science pretends to explain perception of distance are themselves not directly and immediately perceived, nor do they have any real existence. Berkeley states, everyone is themselves the best judge of what they perceive and what not. In vain shall the mathematicians in the world tell me that I perceive certain lines and angles which introduce into my mind the various ideas of distance, so long as I myself am conscious of no such thing. So in paragraph 16 to 28, Barclay considers what we directly and immediately experience, or the immediate or proper objects of sight. So instead of geometrical relations, there are actual physical sensations. So the sensation arising from the turning of our eyes and not the changing of an optic axis. So the movement of our eyes in unison, inward or outward, in um, response to the changing distance of an object that we're focusing on. Um, so it's not about divergent rays, it's about uh, the confused uh, appearance when an object is very near 
or the straining of the eye while focusing on something far away. And then he goes on to say that it is true in most cases that that diverse other circumstances contribute to frame our idea of distance. Say number, size, kind, many things that will come out in the later discussions of things seen. Two examples might be uh, faraway objects have less intense colors and uh, one object's color may block out the colors of another. But in paragraph 28 he goes on to say that concerning which as well as all other of the aforementioned occasions which suggest distance, I shall only observe that they have none of them in their own nature any relation or connection with distance. Otherwise, then as by experience, they have been found to be associated with them. I think it's important to point out that Barclay does maintain that this mathematical analysis may have great utility and it may go to further our understanding of vision, but it is not what we experience, and it is not how we judge distance. So now, in support of his arguments about how our vision works, he discusses the work of a Dr. Barrow. Now, in Dr. Barrow's work, he outlined a problem that um, Dr. Barrow could not explain, but Barclay claims that using the principles that he's developed so far, he can clearly explain Dr. Barrow's problem. From 33 to 39, he does more detailed analysis on vision in regards to distance, including some illustrations. And then by paragraph 40, he's introducing a query made by a Dr. Molino, which uh, today is known as Molino's problem. If you want to know more about Molino's problem, do a search on the internet. Basically consists of the query, if a person was born blind and they suddenly had their sight restored, would they be able to immediately identify the objects that they were familiar with via touch only through their vision? Now. The philosopher John Locke had written a response to this problem in one of his works saying that yes, the person would be able to do this. George Barclay dis strongly disagreed with John Locke and that's probably one of the inspirations for this work. So then Barclay argues that a man born blind would only understand distance through, of course, touch and sound. So if being made to see suddenly, he would at first have no idea of distance by sight. Nothing would at first appear to him closer or farther away. The sun and stars, the remotest objects as well as the nearer, would seem to be in his eye, or rather in his mind. What he would see would constitute a completely new set of sensations, an explosion of color that would have no immediate relation to the world he knew by touch. He would have to gradually learn to associate what he saw with what he was familiar with by touch. Now just as an aside, it's um, pretty well accepted today that Barclay's interpretation of Molino's problem is the correct one. So according to Molino's problem, our, uh, the information that we receive from touch and the information we receive from sight are completely separate and unrelated streams of data. So in Barclay's terminology, tangible extension figure are distinct from the immediate objects of sight. Now colors are proper and immediate objects of sight. And Barclay in paragraph 43 mentions that um, at the time and today they are considered not without the mind. So without the mind means something has an external existence apart from the human intellect, not without the mind, they're internal to us. So colors, the proper and immediate objects of sight, are really in our minds. Now Barclay suggests at this point that given that he's made this distinction between visible and tangible, that the visible extension, the visible figure, the visible motion are also not without the mind, meaning they have no external existence. 
But just keep in mind that he is referring to the visible extension, not the tangible extension, to the visible motion, not the tangible motion, which, due to Molono's problem, he has he is able to say that they are distinct streams of data coming into us. So now, given all of this, specifically in relation to how we perceive distance, Berkeley, Berkeley then appeals to the reader's experience here and asks the question whether the visible extension or shape of any object doth not appear as near to him as the color of that object. Nay, do they not appear in the exact same place? Now, if color is not without the mind, then how can you say that figure is without the mind? Or if you say that color is only internally perceived by me, then how can you say that the figure is external? Is not the extension figure you see colored? How is it possible to separate and abstract color from the figure and end up with anything intelligible? So therefore, on this basis, he states that the colors you immediately perceive by sight are just as close or far from you as the visible figure extension is. And keep in mind that he is referring to the visible extension and visible figure and not the tangible extension, tangible figure. So he follows this up with some examples relating this specifically to our perception of distance. Suppose that looking at the moon, I should say it were 50 or 60 semi-diameters of the earth distant from me. Now what moon am I speaking of? I'm not speaking of the visible moon, which is only a small, round, luminous plane, about 30 visible points in diameter. Now let's say that I am transported to the moon. As I travel, the object varies as I go, and by the time I reach the physical moon, I shall be so far from being near a small, round, luminous, flat object that I shall perceive nothing like that. And if I wish to recover that original image, I would have to return to the earth. Or, suppose I perceive by sight a faint and obscure idea of something which I doubt whether to be a man, a tree, or a tower. But judge it to be a distance of about a mile. It is plain that I cannot mean that what I see is a mile off. Since every step that I take towards it, the appearance alters, and from being obscure, small, and faint, grows clear, large, and vigorous. And when I come to the mile's end, that which I saw first is quite lost. So in these and the like instances, the truth of the matter stands thus. Having of a long time experienced certain ideas perceivable by touch or walking, such as distance, tangible figure, and solidity, to have been connected with certain ideas of sight, I do, upon perceiving these ideas of sight, say at some later time, forthwith conclude what tangible ideas are, by the wanton ordinary course of nature, likely to follow. So again, looking at an object, I perceive a certain visible figure and color with some degree of faintness in other circumstances which from what I have formerly observed from my past experience determined me to think that if I advance forward so many paces or miles, I shall be affected by such and such ideas of touch. So in truth and strictness of speech, I do not see the distance itself. In fact, really, the distance is measured by the motion of my body moving that distance, experiencing that, coming up to the object and coming in physical contact with it, so that at some other date, when I'm far off and I see a similar picture, due to these experiences that I have over my life, I am able to judge distance without actually having to physically travel anymore.